introduction by Mr. E.B. White, one of our foremost writers who lives a good deal of the year up in Maine. He wrote this story, and he's going to tell it to you. It's called A Maine Lobster Man. There's an old saying that if you're born on an island, you'll get your feet wet. The sea, with its islands, is the place of business for a whole breed of men who don't mind wet feet. It is where the main lobster fisherman works, nine months out of the year. His traps, his hopes, his investment, all lie 20 fathoms deep on rocky bottom off the coast of Maine. Here on this granite ledge above this sheltered cove begins his day, one day in the life of one man. This fellow's name is Eugene Eaton, and he's island born. As days go, this is a good day, but it starts early and it has its rough moments later on. It starts as soon as there's any light in the sky, the hour of the fisherman, the hour of the crow. Most men go somewhere to work in the morning, and every man has some sort of destination, vague or positive. Along Maine's green indented coast, the destination of many a solid citizen is a small wooden buoy marking a lobster trap buried on sea bottom near a ledge some miles offshore. The buoy's got his name on it. It's got his number on it. It's not hard to get to if you can find it in the fog. The trap is easy to haul if you know how, but it's no job for the lazy or the fearful. As for Eugene Eaton, it fits him like a glove. My name is Eugene Eaton. I'm a lobster fisherman at Deer Isle on the coast of Maine. I have 140 traps to haul today, and I'll show you where they are on the chart. I have 15 at Halbert Lage. From there, I will go to Saddleback Lage and haul 12 more. From there, I will go on to Marshall Shore and haul 25 more. And I'll finish up at the southern of Spirit Lage. It's getting late. And I guess I'd better be busy. Saddleback, the Marshall Shore, Spirit Ledge, the destinations of a Deer Isle businessman, today and every working day. Beyond the curtain of the fog, a fisherman is out of sight, but not out of mind. And if a man sets out to catch lobsters, he needs to know somebody on shore who'll buy them when he brings them in. Gus Hensler. I'm a native of Deer Isle. I've lived here all my life. In my younger days, I used to catch lobsters for a living. About 25 years ago, I decided to go into a business of buying lobsters from the fishermen and shipping to the market. We also have a marine hardware store from which we supply the fishermen with our fishing supplies. Uh, Eugene Needon is one of our good fishermen. Uh, what I call a good fisherman is a man that, that works hard, a man that has a good boat, good equipment, has built up a good gang of lobster gear, and has a plenty of ambition. Uh, Eugene, he goes in all kinds of weather, rain, fog, or good weather. Uh, 
on the coast of Maine, we have all kinds of weather, and there's a living for a man in the Atlantic Ocean if he has the push to go and get it. A good string of traps, a good boat, and a long day ahead from almost every cove and gunk hole in Maine's long coastline. At this hour of the day, there comes the counterpart of this small white power boat. High cocky bow, a lovely sheer, low in the waist, a broad flat stern, a boat whose shape has evolved in the course of performing a special task. Through his windshield, he gazes at the upthrust nose of his particular love, cutting through the early morning fog toward the first marker of the day. The throaty rumble of the exhaust is the music that he knows, the theme that he understands. office, he has a 34-foot boat. For desk, a shelf that holds his compass. On his wall is a calendar that shows his engagements with the tide, high water and low water. His garb is conventional for morning wear at sea, yellow waterproof apron to shed the water that comes aboard with every haul, and as soon as he gets hauling, white cotton gloves to protect his hands from urchin spines. A fisherman is born, not made. If a man lacks a natural feeling for the sea, no amount of instruction will do the trick. Eugene Eaton is a natural fisherman. He was messing around in boats almost as soon as he could walk. Under him, this boat is like a wise and willing polo pony as she goes about her work, following his buoys as a pony follows the ball. Each motion must be exact perfectly timed, yet no two halls are just alike, and every trap comes up differently, according to wind and tide and the behavior of the boat. It looks to the casual observer as though the art might be learned by any bright apprentice, but unless there are a few ounces of seawater running in a man's veins, he will never make a trapper. A lobster trap is simply a slatted wooden cage ballasted with flat rocks to make it sink, baited with old fish to give it a lure. The bait, herring and redfish, must be at the proper stage of ripeness, neither too fresh nor too gamey. For the lobster, food of gourmets, is himself something of a gourmet. The fisherman knows this and tries to give him what he likes. Bell off the halibut rocks is what Gene runs for when he starts his haul. Today, this barren pile stands plainly visible. On other mornings, you can be within a few feet of the rocks and not see them. The compass in Gene's boat is off by three or four points, but he is used to it. And besides, finding your way in a fog, there's a lot of guesswork in it when the tide runs strong. Lunch is the only break in the fisherman's day. It's the time he takes his gloves off. A hot exhaust pipe, completely exposed, provides central heating in the dining room, taking the edge off a cold December morning, adding the final wallop to a steaming August afternoon. Lunch is the heavy day the trapper keeps with himself, and he usually eats it on the run between his strings of traps. Spirit Ledge, a world of gulls and shag, world of the spirit and the smell of bait. This is a different world, this pale gray world of outer islands and dry ledges. To the fisherman who visits it regularly, it's a morning world, a familiar book with chapters still to come. From the
the Marshall Shore south, he begins to find his traps. As the light strengthens, the fog scales. The boat rolls sleepily in the leftover sea, and today's wind already beginning to blow. A buoy is sighted, the familiar orange paint. The boat approaches swiftly. At the right moment, the man eases his motor, rolls his wheel, pulls his clutch. With his gaff, he brings the warp aboard. He enters it in the snatch block, takes a couple of turns around the winch head, and the hoister takes over the work. The trap breaks water and is hauled on deck. More lobsters, plus a dozen crabs and miscellaneous inhabitants of the ocean floor. The crabs are returned without comment, not worth this fisherman's while to bother with. A bushel basket makes a satisfactory catch-all on a lobster boat and it must be kept cool and wet. A dry lobster is a dead lobster. To send the trap overboard looks simple, as though you need only push it into the sea anywhere at all. But the good fisherman knows almost to the foot how much water he has under him and what the bottom is like. If the bottom is wrong, there'll be no lobster waiting. If the depth is too great, the trap will pull the buoy under and he'll never see his trap again. It's blowing now from the southwest, too rough for good hauling. The ebb tide runs against the wind and kicks up a nasty chop. The boat punches cheerfully into it and rolls her bottom out on some of the turns. A fisherman doesn't deliberately start out in the morning if the breeze is like this, but if he goes out and later the sea makes up, he'll usually stay out and complete his haul. Here, under the lee of the island, the wind is less strong, the sea more reasonable. Norwester wears traps on her stern now, traps that are being shifted from one location to another according to the instincts of the trapper, who is always seeking greener pastures on bottom. The day wears on, the bait tub grows empty, but no less fragrant. The fisherman's thoughts return to land, run on ahead of the boat. What does a man think of in these long, long hours? Well, he thinks of the price of lobsters. And Gene Eaton will tell you that if you raise a family, there's most generally some kind of problem at home to think about between traps, but there's always the price of lobsters. The catching of lobsters is not always a profitable enterprise. In spring, the fishing isn't good. A man can just about stay even, he can't get ahead any. In fall, when the fishing improves, the days grow short. Some of the traps must be taken up. There aren't enough daylight hours to haul them. Storms smash the coast and take their toll of boat and gear. But whether the fishing is good or bad, the sea and the boat remain the ruling force in a saltwater man's life. And the quest of fish, the thing that brings not only the rewards of toil, but a sense of freedom, an assurance of hardihood that males unconsciously seek and need. In some ways, lobstering is immensely complex. In another sense, it is simple and direct. It can be done all alone, and while you are doing it, you are your own boss. The sea belongs to all equally. Whatever it holds is yours for the taking. 
On some days, the passage to Spirit Ledge is a dream of kindly sea and wind and sky, each at peace with the other. On other days, it is a nightmare of cold fog and foul tides. But as Gus Hensler put it, there's a good living to be made in the Atlantic Ocean if anybody will go and get it. With his catch aboard and his troubles over, Eugene heads for Hen Island, a receiving station for lobster catches in this neck of the woods. This is part of Gus Hensler's domain. Gus owns the island. Here he receives lobsters, shells out green money to the fishermen, and sells them gas. Alongside the long-legged wharf, Norwester comes to rest for the first time since daybreak. Gene unloads his catch and weighs it in. From here, the lobsters will be dumped into a pound or holding basin to await shipment to the markets. A 200 pound day, roughly $60. This is one of those days when you get ahead. taken some gas in his tanks and the cost will be deducted from his pay. A boat like Eugene Eaton's does not merely transport a man to his traps in the sea. It carries him in some degree to where all men want to go, or the destination that gives the illusion of security and strength. The boat is a living prop to the spirit of the man its strong growl under him, the exhilarating feeling of support. He's finished his run and sold his catch. The winds of afternoon have blown themselves out. The cove awaits him in tranquility. In lands where men are free, no sight is finer to the eye than the homecoming of an independent man, a trapper home from the sea. <laughs> 